Hello, everyone, and welcome to our midweek recharge, our first midweek recharge of 2024. And um, I am one, I'm going to be a student today taking notes uh, with the, the great team of Summer Friday, who are going to discuss Gen Z and the rise of TikTok. Um, I am grateful to be uh, your host today. Um, Chet Delzell, I'm president of Marketing Club of New York for 2024. And um, joining us today are uh, a triumvirate from uh, our friends at Summer Friday, including our immediate past um, president, Alicia Wiedemann. Hello, Alicia, how are you? And she's joined by Kelsey and Patricia uh, from the Summer Friday team. And you guys all are probably in wonderful remote locations <laughs> around the globe or close to home. So I'm glad to see you all here. Um, and Olivia, if you could advance for me to the next slide, that'd be great. So um, I like to start out our discussion today with just a reminder of what our mission is. And it's education and connection are your two big verbs here. Um, today's our education and we elected to have everybody uh, pointing up on screen today. So if you go to your gallery setting, you can see which colleagues of yours are joining today's call. We're also recording this call because uh, we want to build a library of uh, skill sets and knowledge for to share with uh, for each of you after the call and certainly any colleagues that may have missed it. Uh, some great content. I know we're gonna be leveraging a lot of this content also on our marketing insight um, source resource section of our website. Next slide, thanks. Um, we do have a couple non-members on the call. So I'm asking folks if you can to take the opportunity to join the club. Um, all we ask are a few data bits. There's no uh, money uh, required to join. We have a, a corporate sponsorship led model this year. And this QR code will indeed uh, get you right into uh, the opportunity to join. Uh, one of the benefits of joining certainly is the opportunity to save uh, on a lot of our virtual functions are free for members and also um, a much reduced prices at some of our live events. Uh, next slide. Oh, wow, look up, live events. <laughs> so we have uh, a March Madness meetup coming up at Boss Tweeds, which is down in Tribeca on Warren Street. So uh, very close to all the subways. And that's gonna be on uh, March 13th. I know there's some basketball fans out there, so I promise there'll be a screen or two available with the, any games that are on. And um, we also have a connected TV, a date to be set. That's gonna be also a live event at Arno Restaurant in the Fashion District here in New York. Uh, we'll have that uh, set up and pushed out to everybody uh, with uh, uh, all the details uh, probably within the next couple of weeks. Um, then our big spring outing is play ball at Yankee Stadium against the Seattle Mariners. Um, we've had uh, certainly um, uh, a lot of excitement around uh, going to the Yankees game. It's been a while since we visited one of our sports teams, and this is a great opportunity for some uh, comfortable networking, uh, freedom of movement. We're in a balcony area overlooking the uh, down the third base or first baseline. So it's gonna be a great opportunity uh, to come together and root for our hometown team. And then uh, we have our comedy and cocktails. I know a lot of people wanna do this like three times a year. Right now we're, we're looking at September for our a, a cocktail event. And we'll be peppering more events in as we get them scheduled during the year. And just to let you know, um, we don't yet have the date set for our November um, Silver Apples Gala, but this will be our 40th anniversary and we're going to be having a really good time. So uh, please uh, look for 
to make note of that. We'll doing, be doing a call for nominations for uh, Silver Apple Award recipients in um, early summer. And then I wanna thank our sponsors. Uh, we have a corporate led model this year. This is an opportunity to get in front of uh, 150 approaching members plus many, we have about a 2000 people in our prospect database too, people prior guests and uh, who have in expressed interest about the club. Um, and this is an opportunity to get in front of those folks. And uh, I wanted to thank our gold, silver, bronze and supporting sponsors this year going into 2024 for your uh, wonderful support. We have some newbies on the list and we have some tried and true. So all are appreciated. And uh, next, if you wanna get your company involved, there's an easy way to do it. Kyle, I think you're on the call. You're, he's our sponsorship chair this year and uh, he's put together great packages and can even tailor a package specific for your company. So uh, just uh, speak up and if you want to get your company involved as a sponsor. And now I am very excited to talk about the faculty today and I'm gonna let Alicia do all the introductions because it's her great team. But I also wanna say thank you to Alicia for being uh, a 2024 sponsor again this year and the great work of her team um, at Summer Friday to keep us all engaged and involved. Alicia. Thanks, Chad. <clears throat> All right, real quick, um, just wanted to introduce Summer Friday. Uh, so Summer Friday is a creative agency that really focuses on um, strategic development for campaign planning across um, the full marketing landscape. So doing everything from video production to digital production and um, everything you can imagine in between. So with me today, I have uh, two wonderful members of my team, uh, Patricia who is the Director of Client Strategy, and Kelsey, who is our Client Strategist, um, and who has done a ton of work pulling this together in, in some of our more recent reports. So really excited to have them with me, um, and you'll meet them in a minute. So diving right in, you know, what we really wanted to do is just kind of set the stage. Um, what is Gen Z and why is it important? Uh, first, Gen Z, uh, just as a quick refresher for everyone, um, is the generation born between 1997 and 2012. Um, they have a population of about 72 million in the U.S. Um, some are obviously still preteens, younger, um, but a lot are starting to enter the workforce. A lot have jobs, um, starting to take mortgages out. Um, but really, when it comes down to marketing and, and why we care and why we should care more and more, is really looking at the fact um, that they have massive spending power. So their net spending power right now is about 360 billion. Um, and in terms of their size in relation to other generations, they make up about 30% of the total global population right now. And it's predicted by that by next year, Gen Z will actually make up 27% of the workforce. So in this presentation, we're gonna go through a little bit of who they are, how they think, um, but then also lean into how that's changing the workspace and how we need to adapt, one, as marketers and two, as managers, um, to make sure that we're building the culture and the environment um, where they want to work. And if there's any questions, Kelsey here is Gen Z, so she can weigh in and, and uh, fact check everything for us. So, you know, the first thing that we really wanted to kind of pull up is an understanding of the world in which Gen Z grew up. So in order to really understand why they're making different decisions, why they approach things slightly differently, you know, you have to look at when they were born and how the world looked throughout their childhood and development. So again, born between um, 97 and 2012. Um, so, you know, most of them were babies um, or even born after 20, uh, 2000, September 11th, 2001. Uh, so they grew up in a post 9-11 world um, as either young children or again, as they were born, they're born into a financial crisis um, and then a lot of socioeconomic issues. So, you know, between the financial crisis, then gender issues, LGBTQ um, 
and uh, rights issues and um, conversations around that, legalization of same-sex marriage, Me Too movement, um, BLM movement, and of course, uh, the pandemic. And I think, you know, we can go into some detail on how that impacted their lives, but as they were either in grade school or graduating from high school or going to college or taking on their first jobs, all of that was through this odd pandemic world, um, this virtual world. So, you know, when looking at them and really thinking about their upbringing, you know, a lot of um, socioeconomic factors weighed in, climate concerns, pandemic lockdowns, economic worries. But despite all of that, um, despite all of the pessimism surrounding them, um, they really are an optimistic group. Uh, they're known for their idealism. Uh, they advocate for inclusivity and social progress and sustainability. And then their personal life values really center around racial justice and environmental consciousness, leading them to demand a lot more of a meaningful um, actions from companies they work with um, and organizations that they want to buy from. So one of the other things uh, that we certainly can't ignore is how they grew up in a digital first world and how that leans into who they are. So they're really considered digital nat natives um, growing up with internet and technology from a very early age. So looking at this other chart here of when they were born and, and how things progressed, you know, they're the first ever generation to experience a digital connected world with unlimited constant access to technology. If you think about it, you know, their baby photos are still on the internet, are still on social pages, the, the photos that their parents took. They grew up in that middle school, high school age um, with everything about their lives forecast on the internet um, and really having that as, as a core part of who they are. Um, so what really sets them apart from other generations, aside from, you know, how the world looked as they grew up is, how their in world was fully connected, um, their aptitude for technology. They really grew up as native users of things like social media with all the online resources and advanced software, which not only kept them closer and more connected to the world events, um, but also more informed on the world events. Um, that technological connection really empowered them to navigate the complexities of the world they faced um, and navigate it in a way that previous generations really didn't have the ability to do. So unlike former generations, they're really defined by the access they have and the usage of technology throughout their entire lives. And it's really seen as a seamless extension of who they are. Uh, so when you look at some of the stats, you know, 54% of Gen Z spend at least, at least four hours a day on social media, which is a crazy number to think about, or at least from my perspective, it sounds crazy. 61% um, uh, got their first smartphone uh, between the ages of 11 and 17. So they, again, have grown up fully connected at all times. So not surprisingly, um, you know, these online spaces with social media and that being such a core part of their lives has really impacted their self-esteem. One in four Gen Z um, re uh, report a decline in mental health over the last three years, with 70% saying that social media has had a negative impact on their body image. Um, so due to these effects on overall mental health and uh, self-image, they have a really complex relationship with social media. It's a part of their lives. It's an extension of their lives, but they also understand the challenges they're facing. Um, on the flip side, um, having uh, that access is also giving them more connections um, and providing a lot more sources um, and resources for mental health support. So, for example, 50% uh, of Gen Z say they're more likely to use digital mental health programs than Gen X or baby boomers. Um, so what does that really mean moving forward? You know, despite the negative consequences that we just kind of walked through, they're also really uniquely positioned um, going into their adult lives. They're equipped with in a whole digital network um, that they've been able to stay connected with throughout uh, their development um, in a way that previous generations were not. They know that they can stay connected to people um, that aren't just in their immediate circles, but a much, much wider network. 
Um, and they're also tech experts. So they're entering the corporate world with a familiarity and a comfort with tech that other generations have not had. <clears throat> um, one thing though, that we found really interesting um, is how their connection to technology conflicts with some of their ideals. Um, so, you know, with their digital first live, um, you know, Gen Z is notoriously outspoken on the environment. Um, it's huge to who they are and their values, and they're extremely um, afraid of global warming and sustainability. Um, 75% say that they're frightened um, when it comes to the environment. Um, they've even coined the term eco-anxiety, which is the fear of environmental damage. Um, and again, that's really amplified with the social media use um, because they hear about it, they talk about it, their peers are talking about it all of the time and they know that it will impact their lives more than the generations before them. But interestingly enough, their constant connection to the online world is also fueling um, negative environmental outcomes. So when they're scrolling, um, and we talked about how they're online on social, not just online, but on social four hours a day minimum, um, their constant scrolling and that constant connection, especially the constant connection uh, through video streaming is actually contributing to a massive uh, digital carbon footprint. Uh, one frightening stat that we found that we found um, in our research is that the data storage cloud right now has a greater carbon footprint than the airline industry, uh, which is crazy to think about. Um, so honestly, I could go on all day about this, um, but there's there's so much to kind of talk about with Gen Z and environmentalism and sustainability. Um, I'm going to pause there and move on, um, but we do, I just have to do one little plug. We do have um, an ESG and sustainability report coming out in a couple weeks, and it's a four series report. So if you want to hear more about that, you can stay tuned for that. But otherwise, I'm going to actually flip it over to uh, Kelsey, who's going to talk about Gen Z and how they've transformed the idea of the American dream. Yeah, thank you, Alicia. Um, so having kind of established that foundation of who Gen Z is and their influences and their adeptness in navigating this life with these almost distinctive lens through technology. So we'd love to explore how this kind of translate into their experiences when they're entering the workforce specifically. So Gen Z is forging this new narrative within the workforce, and it's one that actually actively redefines the traditional concept that we know of, of the American dream. And so this kind of narrative, it really portrays a group that is not just dreaming, but they're actively working and molding their futures themselves. And they really aspire to be this reinvented version of success that they've made that mirrors their um, adaptability. So the upcoming year is poised to mark a really significant cultural shift, and that's that U.S. companies are going to have to start acknowledging the influence of their Gen Z employees. So uh, as Gen Z is projected to outnumber baby boomers in the workforce, those values and perspectives that they've um, had that Alicia was talking about through their upbringing, it's really going to be shaping the, the future landscape of business and leadership. But, you know, what are exactly these ideals that they're going to be bringing into the workforce? Go to the next slide. Yeah. So to begin with, Gen Z really places an emphasis on community involvement, empowerment, things such as diversity, equity, inclusion, all while seeking really robust leadership that kind of fosters learning and development. So having grown up amidst all of these technological advances, <laughs> experiencing things like the pandemic during the really formative years just as human beings they've kind of established their own set of you know expectations and standards when they entered the workforce so their focus really lies on achieving a balance and a stability in both their personal and professional lives so we're going to just take a quick pause to do our first poll um, and it's related to gen z in the workforce so we can test your, your knowledge of TikTok slang. Um, so the first question that we have is, what is this popular Gen Z term coined on TikTok for choosing to limit one's work ethic and willingness to go above and beyond in the workplace? So you'll see two questions pop up in the poll. Just answer the first one right now.
All right, Olivia, you want to read out what you see on your end for the answers? Yeah, it looks like everyone is coming in with the same answer here. Quiet quitting. All right, we can go to the next slide. Drum roll. <laughs> so it is quiet quitting. Um, so this concept <laughs> of quiet quitting uh, really gained popularity on TikTok, particularly in those Gen Z employee audience. So um, what it signifies is this deliberate choice to kind of not overly invest in work and focus instead on maintaining a healthy work-life balance uh, by really fulfilling only those essential kind of job requirements. So this term really emerged as a response to the failing health culture that we might all be aware of uh, and the corporate norms that really advocate for work kind of consuming one's entire life. So the hashtag actually garnered millions of views, um, which is really interesting because it kind of showcases both the influence of Gen Z, but also of TikTok and kind of reshaping language and, and really challenging convention, uh, conventional, you know, perceptions of the workforce. So continuing on that a topic of Gen Z in the workplace. This generation is really actively reshaping the traditional workplace dynamics. And that is challenging those established mindsets of, you know, all the previous generations. So uh, Gen Z really demonstrates a lack of attachment to their work and really shows a willingness to leave if their work environment doesn't offer that kind of desired balance that they're looking after. So notably nearly half Gen Z individuals would consider quitting due to um and also they're also prioritizing integrating their passions into their professional lives so a significant 37 percent would consider you know leaving their current roles if they're not able to pursue their interests um, while almost a quarter would leave due to a lack of learning opportunities so there's this clear emphasis on achieving work-life balance while also fostering a culture of learning and continued personal growth by kind of striking this balance and dedicating time outside of work to pursue things like passion projects, which brings us to our next really great point and bringing up the phenomenon of the side hustle. So with the internet and kind of the diverse resources lowering barriers to entry, um, the concept of the side hustle has really emerged to be this really coveted pursuit for Gen Z. And many are successfully managing their businesses alongside their full-time jobs. Uh, as evidenced by over half, as you can see, over half of Gen Z is already engaging in some sort of side hustle. So uh, in addition, you know, beyond just pursuing their passions, they're also recognizing the need for maybe some additional income to support their lifestyle and, and covering their expenses um, like um, bills and rent. Uh, but the potential of side hustles are really limitless, as, as we'll be able to see. Because side hustles have really proliferated among Gen Z, and it's it's definitely been facilitated by that access to resources that they have. And it's almost to the extent where there's virtually no excuse not to have one at this point. So some popular side hustles that are currently um, embraced by Gen Z includes selling their own products and art forms on uh, forums such as Etsy, maybe delving into affiliate marketing with Amazon, uh, establishing themselves as influencers and showcasing their lives and gaining brand sponsorships. Uh, and there's also, you know, the more traditional route of freelancing with things like web design and blog writing. So these examples really just scratch the surface of, you know, the possibilities in the realm of society. And even beyond social, um, you know, opportunities for side hustles can include things like um, hosting Airbnbs or food shopping. Um, and with this kind of, you know, access to the internet and extensive networking, uh, they, Gen Z has kind of find it a little bit easier than ever to generate income in a more informal manner. Um, and with those resources, they're really pushing the boundaries and exploring, you know, new avenues to, to make more earnings. So, Behaviors such as the rise in side hustle uncover a great deal about our, you know, digital native Gen Zers, suggesting that um, they've come to be more entrepreneurial at a young age than previous generations. So this trend, um, it's definitely driven by many factors that we've already discussed, such as their relationship with tech or the rejection of corporate norms. 
desire for increased flexibility and their optimism about their futures. So their sense of agency and autonomy over their futures has really spurred a lot of Gen Zs to, you know, embrace entrepreneurship and they're really becoming a force for change in, in the business world. So the modern interpretation of the American dream that Gen Z has kind of crafted for themselves, again, it's showing a generation that is not just dreaming, but they're kind of actively forming their futures. And despite facing things like burnout, they still remain resilient and resolute, and they're still going after that reinvented uh, definition of success. Um, and prioritizing work-life balance, they value more experiences over you know, material possessions. And for Gen Z, the American dream isn't just defined by grandeur or these prestigious titles, but they're more motivated by comfort and maybe the freedom, the, the freedom to kind of savor life's moments and, and live in the moment. So Gen Z has also wholeheartedly embraced TikTok um, as evidenced by, we've seen the rise in side hustles on there and just this emergence of new waves of creators and influencers. And it's really a symbiotic relationship that, um, has influenced their behavior, making processes, lifestyles. So the discourse around TikTok or the discourse around Gen Z, it fre frequently kind of intersects with TikTok because they're so intertwined, whether you're viewing it through the lens of, you know, their entrepreneurial drive on the app or even just the app's kind of presence in their daily lives. So it's undeniably become the platform for this generation and it's shaping their experiences and interactions and decisions. So kind of looking at how Gen Z utilizes techno, it's really become a focal point for both our time and spending, unlike any previous generation with 80% of Gen Z kind of engaging with the app daily and over three quarters, you know, making direct purchases after seeing something on the app. And it stands out as their preferred app with over with 60% of TikTok users being a part of Gen Z. And they're turning for TikTok for a multitude of reasons, but one of them is for a consistent kind of stream of positive information or entertainment, whatever it may be, um, you know, with a significant portion of them kind of using it to, quote, uplift their spirits on a regular basis. So they're continually going back to that app. Um, and they also kind of, leverage the app as their primary source for information. Uh, for instance, as a Gen Zer, I know that when I want to learn more about a new restaurant in town, I don't just go to Google or Yelp for reviews and pictures. I go to TikTok to see what the influencers in my area are saying about it and sharing it about it. But TikTok isn't exclusively just for Gen Z, of course. Older generations are also actively kind of contributing to the, the app's success, and especially with the emergence of this influencer trend. Um, so it's kind of captivated the entire platform, and it, it kind of shows an interesting dy dynamic because when younger, maybe Gen Zers, are aspiring to be full-time influencers on TikTok, um, they can often be, you know, motivated um, by the financial gain. But, you know, with these older influencers, um, they may be engaging for different reasons or just leisurely or just trying to keep connected or stay with the times with the younger <laughs> demographics. Um, so some just notable examples um, highlight the success of these influencers with different motives. So for example, Babs here shown on the right, um, she's a retired grandmother who started posting cooking videos during the pandemic, and she's garnered almost 4 million followers. Um, and yeah, if you watch some of her videos, they're very comforting, and you almost see her as your own grandmother. So um, yeah, they're using TikTok in many, many ways. But so it's truly become the platform for all age groups kind of revolutionizing the overall social media landscape. Um, but now I'll hand it over to Patricia to kind of dive a bit deeper into the world of TikTok. Yes, it really wouldn't be a Gen Z presentation if we didn't do a deeper dive into TikTok overall. So we we felt we needed to do that, but Kelsey really set this up perfectly in saying that TikTok really does go beyond Gen Z now. And honestly, the trends on TikTok go beyond TikTok. It has a lot of influence on a lot of other digital channels and even our culture today. So we're going to dive a bit more into what all of that looks like. I think the first thing that is most remarkable about TikTok that we want to quickly touch on is the 
exponential amount of growth it's received since it launched in 2016. Um, the time it took to get to a billion followers, TikTok took to get to a billion followers was only three years compared to other channels who hit, um, who were like Instagram that took seven to eight years. Um, the number of active users on TikTok also just rises exponentially and continues to do so, um, while most other platforms took mo many more years to get to that point. Um, what's really interesting about all of this is you really see that TikTok mastered their media social media growth blueprint. Blueprint. They found the platform really found a way to in, actively engage users um, and expand the platform so much faster. And that really started with Gen Z. It took off with Gen Z, and now it's grown beyond that. Um, it's to the point today where, in less than ten years, uh, TikTok is one of the top most used social networks in the US. And I think one of the most significant stats that we came across in all the research that we've been doing on TikTok is the 1,239% increase in TikTok users from 18 to 23%. That is just such a substantial growth number. And it really shows how the platform has taken social by storm and how quickly it's grown. Um, and then when we see platforms that are growing so quickly, that are gaining so much traction. As marketers, we really want to take a step back and take a closer look at, okay, well, one, who are who is on who is on the platform? Who are we speaking with? But why is the content on this platform growing and resonating so much more than other platforms? And how are people engaging and acting on this platform compared to other platforms? And how does this impact not just TikTok as a platform, like social media in general and content and marketing and digital marketing in general. So that's really what we, our team has been diving into and what we'll go into a bit more over the next few slides. Um, one, the first thing we always have to start with is looking at the demographics. This looks at worldwide TikTok users, not just US. And as expected, um, users under 24, which is most of Gen Z, is the highest percentage of users in the US, but the next age block, which includes older Gen Z and young millennials, is not far behind um, the users under 24. So I think it's important to remember that it's not just uh, the, the college students or the, the recent graduates. This really, this is a platform that is reaching people in their 30s and even going up into age, up to age 44, there's of course a drop off in that third age bucket you're seeing on the screen here. But it's still about 15% of TikTok users. Um, and then if we definitely see larger drop-offs um, as we go 45 and above. So it's really interesting to see, obviously we all associate TikTok with Gen Z and they still are the primary audience on the platform, but they're not the only audience on the platform. And it will be interesting to see how that evolves as the platform continues to grow. Because again, it's only, it hasn't even been, it's only been eight years. <laughs> um, the other really interesting thing when we look at the numbers around TikTok is how engaged users are. In the US in 2023, it was the top platform for average amount of time spent per day, um, over, almost 54 minutes per day, which is incredible when you think about how much time is being spent across all different social channels. Um, having almost an hour a day spent just on TikTok really shows that it's, it's a platform that it's keeping users engaged. Um, it's really keeping users' attention. And a lot of it, I'm sure we are all victims of it, is just the scrolling algorithm. And you just continue to scroll and those short form videos really capture you and pull you in. But there's something more about how the type of content, how authentic it is. It really is keeping people on the platform for longer than others. Um, and then if you go back, actually, the other stat on this slide that's Really interesting is that TikTok compared to TikTok users compared to all social media users are ranking higher in terms of how they are interacting with companies and products. So on TikTok, TikTok users are following more companies and liking more company posts than the average for social media. They're also buying products due to influencers, celebrities, and creators more than the average social media channels. So something about this channel is not only keeping users' attention and keeping them on the platform, but it's driving users to engage um, and interact on the platform as well, which as marketers is of course something that's really important for us to keep in mind. Um, but that does not mean that the solution is to always post on TikTok. Something that's really important with TikTok is that the content has to be authentic to TikTok. So 
a brand can't necessarily just post and hope that it will fall in this in this um trend of they'll get more posts on this channel the content has to be authentic to the platform and to the, what the audiences are looking for. So that's just something that's really important to remember as marketers. Um, when there's so much growth on a platform, like exponential growth in such a short amount of time, um, when so many people are spending so much time on a specific platform, it's bound to impact other platforms other content marketing, other digital platforms. Um, and one of the biggest thing, one of the biggest impacts from TikTok is the exponential growth of short form video. Obviously video has been top of mind for marketers for years now. It has been a channel and a content type that we have really leaned into, but more than anything in recent years, short form video has risen above long form video. And a lot of that is what we're seeing because of TikTok. Um, short form videos are simply put more engaging than long form videos. They're driving two times more engagement on average than long form videos. Um, you're also going to see users watching more of your short form video and, versus the users dropping off when you have longer format videos. So all, because of all of this, we're really seeing marketers shift their focus to short form video content, specifically on social moving forward. 33% um, of marketers are saying short form video is going to be the uh, channel they want, a content type they want to invest more in moving forward. And 66% of marketers believe it's the most engaging content format. So all of that to say short form video is probably not just a fad, it is likely here to stay um, and continue to grow as TikTok and TikTok trends grow. Another really interesting impact um, on the digital channels from TikTok is TikTok being used as a search engine, which I think is really unique, interesting for a lot of us to hear because a lot of us grew up in the, I don't know the answer, I'm going to Google it generation, but this new generation is not just going to Google um, because they there's other resources at their disposal. So one interesting stat that we found here is 41% of all Americans, not just Gen Zers, are using TikTok as a search engine. As you can see on the right, the breakdown is that millennials and Gen Z are using TikTok significantly more than older generations. Um, but the most significant stat is that Gen Z, it rely 10% of Gen Z is relying on TikTok more than Google. So it's not just that they're using it just as much as Google, they're actually looking to Google, to TikTok more than Google. Uh, all of this to say TikTok is not going to surpass Google anytime soon. Um, in terms of search, Google is still the main search engine and even YouTube, which has spent years building up um, their, their role in the search space as well, still um, a leader over TikTok. But it's going to be really important to keep this on the radar as we look ahead for the future, for the years coming up. Um, more and more times, specific searches are getting more searches on Google, on TikTok than they are on Google. Um, there's been some recent surveys that showing specifically some niche industries on TikTok that have, that are really gaining garnering these searches. So fashion terms, for example, see 503 more percent higher search rates. If you can go back, Olivia, <laughs> um, more searches on TikTok that they do on Google, which makes sense when we think about what Kelsey was speaking about. A lot of the younger generation looks to their peers, maybe not for dining, but for fashion advice as well. So you want to hear from your community, your influences and your creators about fashion, not necessarily a Google search. Um, the same is happening in the automotive space. And interestingly, the same is happening in the finance space. So the how to invest query has received three times as many searches on TikTok than Google in a recent study that was conducted. This is really interesting. It really shows that there is a large group of people who are going to TikTok for even how to advice, um, not just trend advice. Um, so definitely something that we'll want to keep an eye on um, as we move into 2024 and beyond. Uh, the biggest question really is why are people going to TikTok more than Google? Um, and Adobe conducted a survey with a lot of these results that we're going through right now. And that was one of the things that they really dove into in the survey. And unsurprisingly, the top answer is in why are you going searching on TikTok was the short form video content. 
Um, it's more informative. It's more digestible. It also provides more of a storytelling aspect than having to read through Google search results. Um, obviously, there's a lot of answers on this slide, but a lot of it really leans into the video format um, and that short form video format being a better resource for these people than Google, um, especially when we're thinking about fashion and trends and cars um, and how to's like when you can visualize it and see things. I think that really goes a long way. So it'll be interesting to see how search really search on TikTok evolves um, in the years ahead. We want to do one more poll just to test everyone's knowledge. Um, would love to hear what you think are the trending areas of influence on TikTok. So what niches do you think are some of the most popular content topics on TikTok? And Olivia, if you just wanna start reading out some of the responses as you're getting them. Olivia, do we still have you? Yeah, it looks like we have um, some fitness, travel, entertainment. Um... Yes, and those are definitely the most expected responses. Um, if you flip to the next slide, some of the, the top areas of content tend to be entertainment, fashion and beauty, lifestyle, DIY, travel, automotive and fitness and sports. And I'm sure a lot of us have found ourselves in these rabbit holes on TikTok that once you start looking at a lot of DIY content, your entire feed becomes DIY videos. Um, but there is a whole realm of TikTok that goes beyond that um, and really beyond what you might expect from a more from social and, and what started as really an entertainment platform. Um, we're really seeing a lot of finance content a lot of health content, a lot of news and pol political content as well. Um, so it's interesting in that TikTok has gone from just being entertainment to now it's it's much more, it's a learning platform, it's an education platform, um, and it continues to grow in that direction as we see more and more content in these niche areas. So finance is one of them, and probably as a surprise to no one, Gen Z is leading the charge, um, that in that Gen Zers are five times more likely to say they'll get financial advice on social route um, compared to adults over 40. Um, they're specifically going to TikTok for budgeting and personal finance, passive income tips, and stock investing. So everything from like high-level personal finance to getting more granular in the stock market, which is really interesting. And there's a handful of different threads and hashtags, FinTalk, there's Finfluencers now, um, finance influencers, there's stock talk um, that have billions and billions of views. So this is not a fad. This is something that has really caught on. Um, but the flip side of it is obviously there's misinformation when a more complex topic is being digested on a social platform, potentially by people who are not necessarily experts. Um, Actually, something that I found really interesting working with a lot of financial service brands is 20% of influencer content um, that contained investment knowledge did not include any form of disclosure, which I think is probably in crazy to think about um, and definitely curious to see how the platform evolves to potentially try to combat some of that. Um, but more than that, there was a recent survey conducted and 83% of Gen Zers in their survey Although they say that they're going to TikTok and social for financial advice, they say that they have encountered misleading information about personal finance on social media when they're doing that. So they're continuing to go to social for advice, but there's, it seems like this generation understands that you cannot maybe necessarily take one video of advice and implement it right away. You should back check and maybe get advice from other people in the community as well. It's great that there's a group of Gen Z that understands that you need to do that, but obviously there's always going to be a group that maybe is misled by misinformation. And it's definitely something that will be interesting to keep an eye on on the platform as these more complex content topics continue to grow. 
Um, that same concern applies for health as well. Health is an area that has really grown on TikTok. Um, almost 59 million people in the U.S. are turning to social media influencers um, for a health advice specifically around chronic conditions. And that number is even larger for Gen Z and millennials. What's really interesting about the health space on TikTok is it's not just patients or it's not just doctors, it's also patients. So people are getting advice from doctors, um, from people in the medical field who are not necessarily doctors, but are using their medical background. And then they're also just getting experience from people who have gone through um, the healthcare system before and are dealing with similar chronic conditions that others may be dealing with. It's really interesting. Um, this is similar to what I, to the Google that. Um, a lot of times we used to go to the doctors and say, I read this on WebMD. Now a lot of people are going to the doctors and saying, I heard this on TikTok. Can you explain this to me? Um, so it's really, it's really interesting just this, how the source of information for people is evolving and more and more people are relying on these influencers on TikTok for serious topics like health, um, despite they're not necessarily always being fact-checking and there being an issue of medical misinformation. Um, it's definitely, again, something to keep an eye on on the platform and see how the platform potentially deals with it and how people start to fact check themselves. And then lastly, news. Um, I think this is really significant as we are going into an election year especially, but 43% of TikTokers regularly get news on the app. And I think most significantly since 2020, the percent of adults under 30 who are scrolling TikTok for news is up 255%, um, which is an incredibly large jump uh, since the last election cycle. It's obviously important to remember that this is not people's only news source. A lot of times it's a discovery source. So you hear about something, you hear from your community members, and then you go to other news sources and read more about it. But as we're going into an election year, it's going to be really important to consider what misinformation will look like on the platform. Um, it's also going to be interesting to see if any politicians try to lean into the platform and maybe try to look at how influencers have connected with these younger generations and try to do that themselves. Uh, it, it's definitely where this platform is definitely has more of a role in the news world today than it did in 2020. And it's incredible that a platform that is that is not even 10 years old has that much influence. Um, but that just really speaks to the exponential growth the platform has seen um, and how, how much the younger generation relies on this platform. Um, it could be a really incredible thing to monitor over this year to see how it may shift perceptions um, and give the younger generation more of a voice than the younger generation has had in the past. All of this to say that TikTok is, an the audience on TikTok is incredibly engaged and an active community. They are looking to their peers, they're looking to influencers, and they're looking to creators for content. They're also engaging from engagement rate standpoints more than any other platforms are, and significantly more than Instagram, which was the which is the next highest engagement rate um, by follower count that is tracked by platforms. Um, so we have a platform where people are looking to engage, um, not only engage, but participate. So we see things like these video challenges um, and just connecting with content creators and then becoming your own content creators. It has created a platform um, and a culture that is less about passively consuming content and more about actively creating content. Um, and this goes beyond TikTok. Uh, the last slide here that we wanted to end on is actually a quote from YouTube. Uh, the Director of Culture and Trends at YouTube, which seems weird to end the TikTok section with a quote from someone from YouTube, but I think it really speaks to the fact that the influence of all these things we're talking about on TikTok transcends beyond TikTok. Um, this phenomenon of moving towards the act of creation and not just passively consuming is definitely something that TikTok has powered, and it will be incredibly interesting to see what that means for content for social and for all digital channels moving forward. Uh, and with that, we wanted to leave about five minutes or so for questions because we know we just bombarded everyone with a lot of stats. 
Uh, so would love to open the floor. Feel free to drop questions in the chat or just go off mute and throw your questions out there. Chad, I think you're muted. <clears throat> Thank you guys. I wanted to just say this was super stuff. There's an opportunity now for everybody to go on camera and talk to each other. It's That's fine too. If you want to, uh, it's like great. Um, I just was kind of curious about a couple things. One, um, are the geopolitics of TikTok being Chinese owned? It doesn't seem to have any dampening effect on people's engagement with the platform at all. Is that a false of uh, concern and do, or do people just not care about it? Or um, I remember, I don't know if you guys saw the 60 minute segment on how TikTok is managed in China versus how TikTok is managed in the United States. They are black and white night and day. They don't, they, there are many more restrictions in China um, than we have in the States. So I'm just curious as to um, any of that is, ever registered with with users yeah i don't know how much it's registered with users i know there's a lot of concern um going into this year in the elections not just our elections here in the u.s but the elections happening in the uk um which are happening soon in the uk there's a lot of scrutiny around tiktok and in tiktok seems to be trying to get ahead of it um to and this kind of answers your question in the chat too bill uh, to really get ahead of deep fakes and false news and um, make sure there's more validation of sources and, and things like that. So I think it's something that is starting to be raised as a concern, um, not necessarily for fashion brands and things like that, but um, predominantly at the moment for news sources and, and especially with elections coming up. Yeah, I mean, um, on the deep fakes, there certainly is a lot of restrictions that... Um, mm -hmm the Federal Elections Commission and for paid political advertising and the use of deep fakes. But we know user generated content is gonna be unleashed. It already has started in the political vein. And how do you detect, rise and moderate that? In, and, do, and in doing so, um, you know, what obligations do we have as ethical users of the platform to uh, make known when a deep fake is in play. Um, I, think yeah, I think I think the other interesting thing too is that, you know, like when we talked about the news um, in our presentation, we talked about healthcare, the phenomenon in healthcare is reversed a little bit where there are now physicians that have TikTok channels, but only because so many people came and said, I saw this on TikTok, can you explain this that they decided to start their own channel so um and you know we have a, a couple of healthcare clients that have done some studies it takes on average 27 days to get a doctor's appointment especially for people with chronic illnesses and so tiktok is a source you can access on the spot in the moment you need it and you can get you know nuanced opinions and so people are going there more and more because the professional advice they need is just so lacking um or delayed and so you're seeing almost a reverse where it started because of the immediacy and the ease of use. And now you're starting to see more professional um, channels coming in. Um, I think we have a question coming in about brands using TikTok. And um, I'm assuming a lot of that is through influencers, but maybe there's more of a direct relationship. Anyone want to comment on that? Yeah, I can jump in from what we've seen or from what I've seen, at least I'll speak to that brands are not necessarily leaning on it for customer service like they do other channels. Um, I There is a lot of brands are leaning on TikTok through influencers, like Chet said already. So that doesn't necessarily lend itself to necessarily being the channel to voice customer service concerns. Um, but that is a great question, and I think something we can dig further into because we didn't really dive into that um, in a lot of the research we were going through over the last few weeks. Yeah, I, mean, I don't I mean, know if any general brands are behind, um, and like the expert advice, like we talked about, is is lagging behind. There's a, there's a big hesitancy to jump into the space. 
Well, I think that I'm just curious. I mean, I would think maybe a direct to consumer brand would be one of the early adopters and trying to have a direct relationship um, with customers there, especially if their customers, you know, skew toward younger audiences um, mm -hmm. on the platform. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, in my in, I'm not a TikTok user, I'm an Instagram user, and I get tons of more and more brands using the feed just as a front door and to generate, you know, uh, interest and leads and stuff, et cetera. Um, I think- Yeah, there's a whole component of shoppable ads that we didn't, we kind of pulled that section out because we were running out of time, but, um, you know, Bill, we can talk about this offline. There's, there's a lot of shoppable functionality within the platform um, that really makes it more of a digital storefront. I remember last in the annual outlook last month, Bruce mentioned connected commerce and which he used to call social commerce, but it, it's evolved. And, you know, this is probably a, a great example of that are in on the TikTok platform. Mm -hmm. So we are up to uh, one minute to go. So I just want to make a big um, push to come down to Tribeca. It's, uh, we're not having a program. We're just having a uh, networking opportunity to have a cocktail, uh, some light bites, and to uh, do some cross-generational networking at, at our uh, club event at Boss Tweeds. That's down on Warren Street in Tribeca. And um, I hope to see all you guys there. And I just say thank you for a super, super program today. I think it is wise that we take some opportunity to do some follow-up programming perhaps uh, based on this topic. Really good stuff. Thank you for your research today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us, Chet. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Enjoy, everyone.